Good morning, my name is Pam, and the Old Testament reading is found in Ezekiel 17, 22 verses through 24. The Lord God proclaims, I myself will take one of the top branches from the tall cedar. I will pluck a tender shoot from its crown, and I myself will plant it on a very high and lofty mountain. On Israel's mountainous highlands, I will plant it, and it will send out branches and bear fruit. It will grow into a mighty cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it and find shelter in the shade of its boughs. Then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and raise up the lowly tree and make the green tree wither and the dry tree bloom. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Naomi. The New Testament reading is found in Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Maggie, and thank you for standing for the gospel reading found in Matthew 13, 31 through 33. He told another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and planted in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the largest of all vegetable plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds in the sky come and nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in the bushel of wheat flour until the yeast had worked its way through all the dough. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's remain standing as we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you speak to us. And Jesus, we ask that by the Holy Spirit, you would now open up our eyes and our hearts and our minds to see and to hear and to understand and to believe all that you're inviting us into, we pray in Christ's name. Everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you. My name's Glenn Packham. I am the um, get to serve as the lead pastor here at New Life at Downtown. Last week, we began a series on the parables of the, some of the stories that Jesus told specifically about the kingdom of God. And we're calling this series, The Kingdom is Like. And one of the reasons we're doing this is because it's very tempting for us to make Jesus our personal little private Jesus, like our dashboard Jesus, you know, the bobblehead Jesus that sits on our dashboard that takes care of our life. And it's, it's easy even to go through a season like we've just gone through with Good Friday and now in all of the Easter season and to think, oh, I'm so glad Jesus died for my sins and I get to go to heaven. And so this is really about a private transaction between me and God. And Jesus was like the mediator slash agent who made the transaction go okay. And now my sins get washed away and I get my passport stamped for heaven. Listen, there's truth to that, of course, but that is not how the New Testament talks about the gospel. In fact, uh, it, it, the gospel writers said that Jesus himself went about preaching and teaching the gospel of the kingdom. And the book of Acts, when it describes, what did Jesus do for the, the 40 plus days that he was uh, around on earth between his resurrection and his ascension, 50 days, he, he ends up teaching about the kingdom of God. He wants his followers to understand this is not just good news for you, this is good news for the world. Or as the British missionary theologian Leslie Newbigin said about 100 years ago, he said, the gospel is a public truth. Now we live in an age where you can have your truth and I'll have my truth and we'll just let it, we'll tolerate each other's truths. And Christians have to quietly acquiesce and say, sure, sure, we want to be good citizens and all of that. But, but what we actually know is the gospel is an explosive public truth. 
It's meant to take over every part of our lives. Religion is not private for us. It is a public thing. That's why in the 9 a.m. service today during the prayer moment, we prayed over people in the business community. Why? Because we think that if you're a follower of Jesus, you participate in God's kingdom even in the business sphere. That the way that you work, the way that you operate your business, it shows up there. That's why this morning we dedicated children. Why? Because we don't think religion is draw this little circle. This is our little private life. And I've got my little faith in Jesus. And I have my little private, personal Lord and Savior. And he's like my dashboard Jesus. And we're just cute right here. No, we're saying, look, in the raising of children, King Jesus, have your way. In the way that I work, King Jesus, have your way. The kingdom is the message of Easter. And so we're doing this whole series to help our brains kind of explode a little bit and expand a little bit. We said last week that parables work if you already begin with the premise of faith. And so Jesus said, specifically in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 13 itself, Jesus said, look, if you don't already believe, the parables aren't going to help you believe. They're not sermon illustrations. They're not arguments. They're not proofs for the existence. But if you will Take the risk and say, okay, I believe, now help me understand. Understanding will actually follow belief. And so followers of Jesus, like the St. Augustine in the 400 said, uh, you, you, I believe in order to understand. And so when we enter these parables, I want you to enter it with the mindset of saying, okay, I believe, now Lord, help me understand. What does that really mean to live under your kingship. This morning's parable is about two things. It's actually two sets of parables, really short ones, seed and yeast, specifically the mustard seed and yeast. And both of these parables have to do with how we think about significance, how we think about success, and how we think about growth. I was thinking this week about our sort of American paradigms of success. And the American story is a remarkable story and the rest of the world has watched it for a couple, over a couple hundred years and said, isn't this amazing how it's just grown a country and business and enterprise and military and the strength globally all around the world. And so as Americans, we tend to perpetuate the stories of people who have come to quote unquote overnight success. Now, of course, Forbes magazine years ago wrote a piece that said, there's no one that's really an overnight success. That even all these entrepreneurs, there's lots of failures and lots of, it's a bumpy road on, to, to the, uh, the place that you got. I don't know how many of you read the, the thick Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. I didn't, but I saw the movie. And, uh, <laughs> and even then you kind of see, well, there's a lots of Lots of ups and downs, lots of starts and stops. There's no sort of overnight. And yet, we continue to prop up these stories of people that we think, wow, a meteoric rise to the top. And maybe in some cases, something does click and it, and it turns. You think about Z Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook or Jack Dorsey and Twitter. Or maybe you think about the people who use social media platforms, the YouTube stars or the Instagram influencers or how people gain followings and, and the, the mass movement of believers around the world. That's Justin Bieber fans, for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, wow, that one really thud, like just <laughs> thud there. No, no believers at uh, New Life Downtown. Okay, great. Um, or maybe you think on the, on, the, um, you know, on the music side, the one hit wonders. What was the song we were all singing five years ago? And now we're like, where is that band, right? Or maybe you think about on the fiction side, J.K. Rowling scribbling inspiration ideas on a napkin and on a train journey that became the Harry Potter stories that dozens of publishers turned down and then one said yes. And you're like, oh, that's me. It's going to happen. It might or it might not. And the question for us is how should we think about significance, about success, about growth, how do we think, even as Christians, we're tempted to sort of Christianize our American notions of significance and success. And so when someone's doing well, we say, oh, God is in that. And then what about someone whose business is not exploding? We say, God is not in that? What do we do with this? Matthew 13 tells two stories that force us to grapple with how we think about significance and success. Verse 31, he told another parable to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and planted in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, 
But when it's grown, it is the largest of all vegetable plants, and it becomes a tree so that the birds in the sky come and nest in its branches. And he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in a bushel of wheat flour until the yeast had worked its way through all the dough. I want to point out a couple similarities um, between both of these things. Both the mustard seed and yeast are small and seemingly insignificant. Both things are small and seemingly insignificant. Both are hidden. A seed is hidden in the dirt, buried in order to grow. Yeast gets mixed in with the flour. You don't look at your lump of dough and say, I still see the yeast. Once it's mixed in, you don't see it. And both work slowly within their context. But there's some differences in these paired parables. One expands outward. The seed grows outward into a tree. The other expands and works inward. The yeast gets further into the dough. The tree, the seed goes up and out. One is expansive, you might say. The other is invasive. Another way to think of it is that one is a kind of permanent presence. It becomes a tree that's now a fixture in that plot of land. It's a permanent presence. And the other is a permeating presence where it just starts to infect everything. It gets on every part of the flower. I want to make three observations about the kingdom of God from these parables, living under God's reign. And the first is this, the way of the kingdom is small and hidden. The way of the kingdom is small and hidden. Now this is often runs counter to how we think. Because we think if God was going to do something, surely it would be big and obvious. Not small and hidden, but big and obvious. Like, oh God, boom. I mean, think about it even from a sort of a spiritual perspective when people start to say, oh, there's revival. I remember I've I've grown up uh, through enough. I'm I'm old enough now to have seen a number of quote unquote revivals. And I am not interested in judging whether it was or was not. I'm only interested in saying the things that we call revivals are when it's big and obvious. But isn't it revival when Christians faithfully love their spouses and care for their kids and take care of their community and welcome uh, friends into their home? Isn't it also revival when we love one another as Christ has loved us? Or is it only revival when it's like dramatic signs and wonders and gold dust? God, the way of the kingdom is small and hidden. I often think that Jesus could have made his resurrection a lot more epic. You know, if you're going to like rise from the grave, like, first of all, don't do it early Sunday morning. Nobody's awake yet. (laughs) Don't you know that prime social media hours for Instagram is like 9 p.m. on Wednesday night? That's really true. (laughs) I mean, like, if you really want to make a splash, Jesus, do this at prime time. Early on Sunday morning. And Paul says that as many as 500 people, he appeared to as many as 500 people. So it's not like it was totally secret. At the same time, I mean, where were the fireworks? The ray, he could have just burst out like sort of the greatest showman, you know, like, this is the greatest show. Gotcha. He doesn't do it. The stories and the gospel writers are kind of conflicting chronologies. People, it just was like, what, did that, what happened? I think the women went first. No, I think John arrived. No, it was Peter. And, and, and it's like, what? Why? Why is this so small and hidden? God does his best work in the dark. I think God does his best work in the dark. You know, the Bible begins with God working in the dark. And the earth was formless and void, but the Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the deep. And God said, let there be light. But that means he was hovering in the dark. You don't know what God is up to in the dark. You don't know in the dark nights of your soul, in the quiet, hidden places, don't be so sure God's not at work. It was in the darkness of 
the formless world that God began to hover and work. It was in the darkness of Sarah's barren womb that God began to work and give Isaac and call forth a blessed and chosen people. It was in the darkness of Mary's womb that the Son of God began to be formed and arrive into our world. And it was in the darkness of a tomb, a borrowed grave, that God called Jesus up from the dead. God does his best work in the dark. And so some of you are, are, are living lives that feel very hidden. You're like, nobody knows what I do. Like, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a counselor, and I see people all day long, and I can't tell their stories, but they have no idea the breakthrough that I just, maybe one thought sparked for someone. Or maybe you're, you're the friend that shows up faithfully in the coffee shop to meet the other friend, and you're just chatting, and you're just connecting, but actually you've been sustaining each other's faith for years now. You're like, nobody knows. I don't, we don't web stream that. I mean, nobody, you know, you're not live casting yourself taking a, you know, a vase of flowers to a person who's just had surgery. Nobody knows. But God knows. The way of the kingdom is small and hidden. One of our kids um, loves to write notes and cards and we don't even know that she's doing it until we hear from someone else. And oftentimes it's, a, it's one of our friends or a teacher or, or someone that uh, is a mother of one of, our, uh, one of their friends. And, and just this week, you, you know, Holly got a text from one of her friends saying, did you know that your daughter wrote me this letter and sent me this? It was just so encouraging and it was so detailed and specific. And we're like, wow, she didn't ask us about that. She didn't tell you. It's just quiet and hidden. Now, she didn't get that from me, okay, because I, I, would, have, I would have been Facebook living the whole thing. No. <laughs> the second observation we make about the kingdom is that the way of the kingdom is slow and steady. It takes its time. It takes its time. We're, we're not in a hurry here. I remember a friend of mine who's in ministry and he decided to do something really different and go away on his annual planning retreat. He decided to go to a Catholic retreat center. And he thought, you know, he thought he was being so, you know, strategic. And, and listen, guys, I love this stuff. I love intentional planning. Holly and I do like a yearly thing. We have our systems in the way that we forecast. We love this stuff, okay? So I'm not, I'm not belittling this. But this friend recounted for me, he went to this retreat center, and they said, he started talking with the Catholic sisters who were there, and they said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm on a strategic retreat. I'm, I'm creating like a planning. And then he starts to make conversation. He says, do you guys as Catholics, do you do, you do like uh, five-year plans? I mean, he's ready to be consultant now, you know? And they, one of the sisters just smiles, and she says, you know, in our tradition, we think more about the 500-year plan. <laughs> and he's like, he was like, What? I was just like mind blowing, like what are you, what? And sometimes maybe we're thinking too short of a perspective, too small. As Dr. Strange said, we're in the end game now. <laughs> you gotta think about the final piece of this. <laughs> no, spo no spoilers, don't worry, no spoilers, Avengers fans. I, um, I remember it, um, 22, I just moved here and began working at the church, and, and a friend said, you, you should go meet with a financial planner and get started in the investment road. And, and I thought, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I work for a church, like there's not much here to go around. And, they, and I was 22 as well, so I was the bottom of the bottom of the uh, rung there. And, and he said, oh, just go with me. So I met with this planner, and you know, as financial planners do, the first question is always, well, what do you think you're going to need in retirement? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm 22. I'm never retiring, you know. Like, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to work forever, you know. And he's like, well, let's just put a number up there, you know. And we start working our way backwards. And he starts talking to me about co concepts like the time value of money and dollar cost averaging and all of the stuff that, that you learn in financial planning. And he was like, you know, if you would just give up like your two Starbucks drinks a week or something, 
you might be able to put away like 100 bucks a month. I was like, oh, that's not going to matter. And then he shows me the projection models. And like, oh, my gosh, that could really make a difference, you know? Like, yes, I can go without the starving. And you start to live differently when you think about a different end. When you have a different end in mind. Christians are called to think with eternity in mind to think of the eternal, to think of a perspective that actually outlives you. Last week, and I don't want to embarrass them, but last week, when during the water baptisms we had on the front row here, you know, I know a lot of the stories of the different families, but one of the, the, the scenes that made me smile was uh, young Adam Reagan was getting baptized, and of course his parents, Nick and Jesse, who serve here at New Life Downtown, were there, and Nick's parents, Ed and Marguerite, were there, and the generations and it just made me think, you know, we celebrate the water baptism like, this is amazing, Adam. Like, but that wasn't a moment that just happened. That moment was generations in the making. That was, listen, you may not see the fruit now of what's happening, but what are you doing now that is actually setting things up for generations to come? We don't know. But the way of the kingdom is slow and steady. It's generations in the making. Some of you are in the middle of something difficult and you're tempted to give up because you don't see results from it. You're like, I'm just quietly being the good Christian at my workplace, but I see other Christians and they're terrible witnesses. Like these people are not treating their customers or their patients well and they're backbiting and gossiping. And I'm a Christian too and I'm trying to do the right thing, but man, nobody seems to care. Listen, stay the course. Stay at it. You don't know what's growing because of your steady faithfulness. A friend of mine is writing a chapter in his new book about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa said yes to the call of God to go to Kolkata to take care of the street kids. And the moment she said yes, she began to experience an extraordinary amount of spiritual deadness or darkness. And her journals, this only came out after her, she had gone to be with Jesus and people began to read her diaries and like, wow, she really struggled. It wasn't like every day Mother Teresa woke up and she's like, I got the joy, 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 joy. She, she was struggling. It didn't feel great. There weren't a lot of results. There weren't a lot of obvious testimonies. Sometimes the pressure we put on missionaries to write newsletters that have like glowing reports from the field. You're like, you know that this is not how the kingdom works, right? And sometimes one missionary is just laying the groundwork for the third generation of missionaries to come back. And we put this pressure and like, come on, let's see the fruit. Or we're gonna revoke our $50 a month. So what if we're, we're participating in the long game? Listen, we don't do Christian ministries or churches any favors by celebrating lists of the 100 fastest growing churches. God may be in that or he may not be, but God might just as much be involved in the work of churches and ministries that's slow and quiet and not obvious. Mother Teresa kept going 30 years, 40 years, kept plowing the ground. And after her death, there were some people who said, maybe we, she, she shouldn't be canonized as a saint because, you know, after all, she experienced all of this distance from God and it wasn't all joyful. Th those people, I mean, this is like, what is this? Like Marie Kondo Christianity? Like if it doesn't spark joy, just stop. Some of you, man, you guys really, you need to watch a few more things on TV and stuff like <laughs> Mother Teresa kept going, and because of it, they decided to canonize her. She's Saint Teresa of Calcutta because she did not quit even in the face of the lack of results. The way of the kingdom is slow and steady. And finally, the way of the kingdom is growth for the good of the world. You see, the stories don't stay with the small and the hidden. The story is, is not about a seed that remains a seed. The story is not about yeast that doesn't get mixed into dough. The story eventually is about growth. You, we have, yes, one mistake is to think the kingdom of God is about the big and the, and the fancy and the obvious. That's one mistake. But can I just say, the other mistake is to think that 
God is only in the obscure. And sometimes this is like the counter movement now where we think anything big is automatically evil. Big church, ooh, duh, disgusting. Big business, ooh, so evil. Big anything, you're like, ugh. The, the virtue is not in its smallness or its largeness. The virtue is in the purpose of the thing. Growth for the good of the world. Ezekiel had this image of a tree that Jesus, it's possible Jesus is, is kind of evoking this imagery that Ezekiel had used. And Ezekiel said, on Israel's mountainous highlands, I will plant it, a branch. I will send out branches that bear fruit. It will grow into a mighty cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it and find shelter in the shade of its boughs. There's a sense in which sometimes prophetic imagery of birds in the Old Testament is a reference to all the nations, the Gentiles coming in. And God's saying, that old calling that I said I was going to bless Abraham so that I could bless the whole world, I still mean it. I still call a people, not for their own sake, but for the sake of the world. And so verse 24 says, then all the trees in the countryside will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and raise up the lowly tree and make the green tree wither and the dry tree bloom. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I, the Lord, will do it. Growth is for the good of the world. You think about both of these things, a tree that provides shade and bread that provides food. Jesus chooses these metaphors because they are things that don't terminate in themselves. In other words, they don't exist for their own sake. They grow, but they end up growing for the sake of someone else. And let me, let me give you a couple examples of how this works. New Life Downtown we began a year or so ago introducing these courses called Emotionally Healthy Relationships and Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I know for some people, they're like, what's with all this emotionally healthy stuff? Is this just like spiritual navel gazing? I've heard that one, you know. Like, why do we need to kind of take stock of what's happening here? And I just, we're just fine. Listen, the goal is not your health simply for your own sake but for the sake of the world. A toxic tree is no good to the world. A bitter root is no good to the world. A healthy you is good for the world. And so we invite you into these things, not to say, oh, do this so you can have another feather in your spiritual cap and say, God, look at me, I passed the EHS course. There's no passing or failing, by the way. It's to do it so that you can say, God, make me a healthy tree so that I can provide shade for others. Make me a good loaf of bread so that you can provide food for others. In fact, in the parable of the yeast and the flour, other translations note a, a, a quantity of wheat flour that she uses, this woman uses. And one of the commentators said, actually, that amount of flour is kind of an outrageous amount of flour. Like, it's not for one family. She was baking for a feast. I love that. I love that Jesus didn't choose a metaphor of just enough. But he chose a metaphor of more than enough. When God multiplies health to you, it's so that you can use that healthiness in your soul and in your spirit to say, how can I comfort others with the same comfort that I have received? When God multiplies strength to you and you're in a place of strength, how can you lift up those who are weak? When God multiplies his grace in you, it's for the sake of more than just you. I think about even our congregation here, New Life Downtown, Seven years or so ago, we began as the first off-site congregation of New Life Church, risky move. The elders were like, let's do it. Let's multiply the kingdom work here in Colorado Springs through New Life. And we began meeting in this small chapel that was too small from day one and two services, 350 people in total, all of this stuff, and we're spilling out. And then we come to Palmer, one service, and then it grows and grows. This past Easter, and I know Easter is Easter. Everybody shows up. Um, but this past Easter, we had over 1,800 people in the building between two services. Now, do we celebrate that just because? No. And does growth also introduce new challenges? You bet. Hence the team's launch today so that more people can serve, right? 
But what does growth allow us to do? It allows us to say, God, how can we take this thing that you're doing and make it good for Colorado Springs? Make it good for downtown. That's why we do the Palmer survey. It's just one of the things. There's all kinds of things that you guys do individually, you know, that is small and hidden and nobody knows about, right? But the Palmer Serve Day, we've done it for a couple years now. And, and, and last year, Jay Benson, Pastor Jay, who, who oversees our, our uh, outreach stuff and our Sunday teams and all that stuff, Jay asked our contact here at Palmer High School, he says, is this, does this stuff really make a difference for you guys at Palmer? Or is this like, he didn't say this part, but basically, is this like a cute Christian thing that we can do to make ourselves feel better about, you know, woo, we, we you know, clean the trophy case, whatever, you know. And, and the, the rep here at Palmer said, actually, you wouldn't believe what a benefit it is to us. He's like, you guys can bring like over 100 people, and for half a day, you knock out things that would have taken us a lot longer to get done. And we would have spent a lot more money to contract out for this. So you have no idea the difference this makes. That's growth for the good of the world. That's not growth for growth's sake. I'm not interested in that. But growth for the good of the world. Amen. Amen. As you think about all this, we realize that in the end, the kingdom is like the king. The kingdom is like the king. Everything that Jesus taught, even the Lord's Prayer that we prayed earlier today, you can look at the life of Jesus, reflect on the life of Jesus and say, I think Jesus lived that prayer. Yes, he did. And then you can look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I think Jesus lived like that. Turned the other cheek, prayed for his enemies, blessed those who were like, yes, he did that. Same thing with these parables. When you read these stories, Jesus was not just a clever storyteller. He was an embodied parable. His very life embodied this. You see, Jesus was the mustard seed and the yeast. The mission of Jesus culminated in his life like a seed being buried in the ground. He died. What kind of Messiah is that? One who gets himself killed and buried. Jesus is like, do you remember the one I told you about the mustard seed? hidden in the dirt, like yeast being hidden in the dough. But yet Jesus rose like the sapling of a tree breaking through the dirt, like bread when the heat is turned up. Jesus rose. Jesus rose. You know what that means? Jesus is the seed and the yeast, not you. So the pressure's off. <laughs> You don't have to go from here today and say, how can I make myself great? I'm going to be a history maker. I'm going to be a world changer. Listen, you're the dirt. <laughs> He's the mustard seed. You're the dough. He's the yeast. Put your faith in Jesus. So things don't seem like they're working out. Okay, just steady on. Keep on embracing the way of the kingdom. Keep on embracing the slow, hidden, steady way of the kingdom. And let Jesus do what Jesus does. Amen? Would you bow your heads this morning?